Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. In case you just happen to wander into this room at random and you didn't know what you were going to hear, <coughs> you were going to hear Eric Domain, so that's who you're going to hear, and what you're going to hear is uh, algorithms meets art, puzzles, and magic. And um, I'm really looking forward to this. I'm sure the rest of you are as well. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. And sorry for standing in the back there. Um, I wanted to, I'm Eric Domain, um, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is uh, joint work with my father, Martin, who's in the back there. Um, and I want to talk in particular about our interactions between art and algorithms, or art and mathematics in general, but most of the mathematics we do is algorithms related. And in particular, we're going to look at some, some other art forms like puzzle design and magic performance and try to have a lot of fun today. Uh, but we found over the years it's been really uh, powerful for us to, to think about algorithms and art together and think about uh, these kinds of problems or, or both aspects of any one problem, both the artistic side and the mathematical side. And by co-developing those, they inspire each other and we just do more work, more fun work, and just more interesting stuff. So that, I'm going to try to convince you you should all do that. Uh, by the end, uh, basically by having fun with a bunch of examples of hey Patrice, um, of our interactions between, between art and algorithms. So that's where we're going. Now, unlike the typical algorithms talk, but like a typical art talk, I'm going to start at the beginning uh, of <laughs> not when I was born, actually before I was born uh, in the 1970s. So this is our, our background and history and sort of where we are coming from. Uh, this is the uh, two pieces from the Domain Glass Studio. Uh, Marty was the uh, father of glass blowing in Canada. He was the first uh, artistic glass studio in, in Canada. Uh, he was commissioned to make uh, goblets for the Queen of England. Uh, these are two goblets that are in national galleries in Canada uh, and so all over the world. And so his background is in, sorry? Speak up, Speak up. yeah. I'll s turn up my volume. <laughs> all right. Um, so his, uh, Marty's background is more in the visual arts, and the glass blowing is one of the many things he did in that context. Um, our first collaboration together was when, <laughs> when I was six years old. That's me. Marty looks about the same. I look a little, <laughs> I look a little different. Um, and uh, we had what was called the Eric and Dad Puzzle Company. This is the beginning of our interest in puzzles and my interest, I guess, in mathematics in general. Uh, although it wasn't explicit at that point, I would help design puzzles and Marty would hand make these uh, wire take apart puzzles and we sold to toy stores across Canada. Uh, so the, and we split the money 50 50, is what it says here. <laughs> uh, so that was our, our, he's my oldest collaborator, you might say. Um, and uh, let's see, then uh, shortly after that, we started traveling uh, around the US mostly. We started in Halifax, where I was born. And sort of for fun, we started traveling in lots of places. Over a four-year period, we lived in 12 different cities, places, and uh-oh, there's more people. <laughs> and uh, th that's right. Come on in. If you want to sit down here, it's nice and personal. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to kick you guys. <laughs> um, so this was a really cool experience for me especially, um, and both of us. I started homeschool. Marty was teaching me at home, initially out of necessity because we were traveling, and later just because we enjoyed it so much. And what homeschool really opened up for me was the idea of, of collaboration. And I got to meet all sorts of different people with different backgrounds, different, uh, all sorts of different places and cultures and, and everything. And we would just talk with them and learn whatever it is they had to, whatever the, it is they knew. And uh, that, that spirit continues today. And in our work today, we, ha we write papers with all sorts of different people. This is the 260-odd co-authors I have. How many people are here that have written papers with me? 
Just a few. Hey, Charles. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> Almost written a paper. I think. Yeah. All right, let's write, so, let's write a paper now. I can double this list. <laughs> um, anyway, back to the, the story. Uh, the, the olden days. I, then I did my undergrad in, back in Halifax. We returned to uh, Dalhousie University. Then I did my master's and PhD at University of Waterloo. PhD was with uh, Anna Lebu, uh, who was there with her kids. Um, and so that was a lot of fun. This is where we learned about theory and algorithms, uh, in particular from my class from Anna. And, we, and Marty got started getting excited in the mathematical side now, convinced that theory was really creative, like art. And that's uh, and now we're at MIT, and we've been here for the last eight years, uh, just down the street in this data center. And uh, MIT has been a really great place for us to explore both the art and the algorithm side of things, and the, the, the math and the science, sorry, <laughs> the math and the art sides. Um, there's obviously a lot of technology at MIT. There's a lot of tools for us to build sculptures, a lot of uh, construction, uh, things that people usually build, uh, used to build, I don't know, robots and whatnot, we can build sculptures with. And there's a lot of students who are excited about art and, and math, obviously. Uh, one of the many toys at MIT is a glass blowing studio. They call it the glass lab to make it sound technical. <laughs> But it is an artistic studio, and I started blowing glass the last three or four years. Are, is anyone here from the glass lab? No, all right. Didn't make it. I guess they, it was full. Um, and, and Marty and I have started blowing glass together, and Marty resumed glass blowing. And these are some uh, pieces uh, that were on exhibit a, a couple of years ago. We don't do Klein bottles. <laughs> That's easy. We try to do. Um, pieces that even glassblowers don't know how to make. So it's like a puzzle for a glassblower to figure out how it's done. It's not so obvious. It takes them a while to figure it out. Um, and uh, a bunch of these pieces were on exhibit recently in a place called Florenceville, New Brunswick, Canada, <laughs> <laughs> uh, near where Marty originally blew glass. And Florenceville has a gallery, but it also is the French capital of the world. It's a pretty small town. And if you've ever had McDonald's French fries, or uh, any McCain's frozen french fries. About 60 to 70 percent of the world's frozen french fries come from this town. <laughs> and it's a big trade secret about how they're made. We, we couldn't get into their facility. Uh, but we agreed to have our exhibit provided we could make them glass frozen french fries. <laughs> now these are a little crunchier than the usual ones. Uh, and this, this is not glass. This is the regular packaging. Um, but <laughs> Zero trans fat, indeed. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, high in silica. Um, so they ate them up, and uh, they're on display at the, the corporate headquarters. So, so that was just a um, little diversion. Lately, we've been working on incorporating the collaboration idea, which is so prevalent in math and theory, into art, where it's not so common. It's rare for multiple artists to be in control of one piece. And so these are some pieces we did where we improvise and, and switch who's in control throughout the piece totally ad hoc. Um, but I want to talk uh, not just about art, but about these connections between art and math and how we evolve them together. Um, we, our perspective is that uh, over the years, more and more, we are converging. Marty comes from the art background. I come from the math background. But we're meeting somewhere in the middle. And we sort of view art and math as the same thing. They're both about being creative. That is the central goal. Uh, it, within that creativity, there's having some clever insight of what you want to do, what theorem you want to prove, or what sculpture you want to build, or performance you want to perform, or puzzle you want to design. Uh, and then once you have that idea, it's not enough. You also have to be really good at executing within your medium. And uh, it, be it your medium is mathematical proof, or sculpture, or performance, or puzzle, or whatever. Um, we even claim that mathematics is an art form. Uh, a lot of people might say art is mathematics, but we like to turn it around. Uh, a lot of mathematicians try not just to prove a theorem, but they try to prove it in an elegant way, in a simple way. Uh, and I encourage you to keep doing that, because that is the artistic process of finding something beautiful, not just finding something. Uh, and even just the elegance in the, in the theorem statement and so on. Um, so that's sort of, I'd like to claim all of you are artists, and you should embrace that. Um, 
maybe you already knew that, that's a mixed audience, but uh, more practically speaking, even if you don't believe that, um, we find it really helpful for doing geometric research or anything that's, that's spatial um, to do sculpture just to help our visualization skills. So we, I started out with very poor visualization skills, but through art and sculpture building, we've, we uh, find this really helpful. In particular, when we don't understand something geometrically, we try to build a sculpture inspired by that mathematics. And then we learn about what's going on there. And that, so that's sculpture inspired by mathematics. And then by building that, we learn something new and try to turn that back into new mathematics. So by working these two things together, we do more interesting things. That's the, the thesis of today. And I'm going to give you two main examples, so running examples of switching between art and math in the same topic, and a few diversions in the middle. So the first main example is called pleated folding. And I have some examples here. Uh, this is a square piece of paper folded along concentric squares, alternating mountain and valley, and also fold the diagonals. And uh, it folds into this form automatically. It's, we call it self-folding origami, because you just let go, and there it is. Um, we call it a hyperbolic paraboloid. For about 10 years or so, uh, people have conjectured that this is a hyperbolic saddle surface, uh, but no one knows. Um, and it's cool. We like to understand why does the paper fold into this form. Uh, before we thought about the mathematical side, we actually started with the artistic side. So this is our first art and math collaboration. This is an and this is with Anna and Marty. Um, this is an algorithm for generating sculpture. The input. This is a really naive question. Yes. What is necessary to prove that that's? We'll get there. Okay. I'm actually going to give you the answer. Okay. It's just okay. like I'm building suspense. <laughs> You're in on the secret. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is just, you know, assuming this, this is what it is, you can start joining several of them together. So here's one hyperbolic paraboloid, a whole bunch of them. This is 24 of them, representing a cube. And there's an algorithm that turns any convex polyhedron into one of these hyperhedron sculptures. Um, so that was our first endeavor 10 years ago. And this, so this story spans 10 years. And we started with the art side. Uh, Continuing on that theme, both of these forms actually go back to the Bauhaus in the late 20s. This is an even cooler one, maybe, where you just fold concentric circles, alternating mountain and valley. Uh, you have to cut a hole out of the center to make it fold. But you get another kind of saddle surface, something else. Uh, doesn't look like a function, but there it is. And again, it's self-folding origami. Uh, the next thing we did was mathematical or computer science, uh, where we took we have these real models, which we'd like to understand how they're folding. These are photographs of real models, and we simulated them. So the bottom three pictures are simulations. It's a particle spring system that uh, implements the forces of paper, which are at the creases, paper wants to stay bent locally, and at the flat parts where it's uncreased, it wants to stay flat as much as possible. These are local forces, and you find some equilibrium, and these are the, the local optima. So, we understand now why paper is folding the way it is. Uh, we'd like to harness that power. Uh, here's an example of the, the simulation. Uh, this is with concentric uh, hexagons instead of squares or circles. And you get a cool sort of monkey saddle, I guess. And now, once you understand that, uh, yeah? Is there a preferred algorithm that you fold it, or is it just like There are. Multiple optima, like this one, can be folded in a couple of different ways, and it depends how you set up the the initial conditions, exactly what form you get. For the circle, or uh, so I'm fixing the mountains and valleys here, and sorry, I'm going to keep showing this, otherwise it's kind of boring. Um, in this case, you have three corners up and three corners down. There's, a, some, there's, I think, two possibilities for the case of the hexagon. For larger polygons, there could be more. For the square, it's unique, except you can uh, pop it this way. So it doesn't like to be there in the middle, but either side is a local optimum. Is that sir? Charles? Odd degree, three does not work. 
but for our higher odd numbers, it's OK. Essentially, two of them work together as if it's an even thing. Yeah, other question? <laughs> the circles or? And the squares, you just sit there and you, well, I mean, first you pre-crease. You just fold each crease and then unfold. And then you just start collapsing all the folds at once until you get this sort of X. And then you let go and it pops into here. There are other ways to do it, but that's how we usually do it in origami world. But the circles, we usually use a laser cutter or a sign cutter that scores everything. And then you sit there and fold for hours. We just cut from one side. For thin material, that's fine. So how does it decide in which By when you push it. So when you, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, manual labor. I mean, the scoring is just so you get aligned with the grid. But then you have to force all the creases in one way or the other. And then it remembers that. Because it's sort of locally bent in that direction. All right. So from the outside or the inside? Uh, <laughs> With paper, we start from the outside. With metal, we find we should start from the inside. We'll get to metal later. Um, so now, once you have a computer model of what's going on with that paper model, you can, take, you can build a physical sculpture of the virtual model of the physical piece of paper, naturally, <laughs> closing the loop. Uh, these are, uh, this is from, sort of printed from the 3D model we have. This is about a, a meter or so, and uh, each of these vertices is a ball 3D printed out of plastic with holes at exactly the right angles so that the aluminum rods fit together. And the aluminum rods represent the creases in the hyperbolic paraboloid. Or actually, sorry, this is the hexagon. And uh, there you go. It doesn't fold anymore. It's rigid. But it's sort of proving physically that we've built a virtual model, which is fun. So that In principle, you could do it with springs. Of course, you could also do it with a piece of paper. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we have tried some experiments, but it's a little hard to get the materials actually working. Uh, open problem in the art world, maybe. <laughs> um, so going back to mathematics now, uh, just recently, like end of last year, we've been stud studying these forms a lot, and whether they actually exist, and it turned, this is getting back to your question, it turns out the hyperbolic paraboloid doesn't even exist. So proving that it's a hyperbolic paraboloid is a little bit of a challenge. Um, this was quite a surprise to, to a lot of people, including myself. Uh, we thought that it existed, but it just ain't so. It's in this thing here, which I just told you how to fold, does, does not exist. It's impossible to fold a square piece of paper with exactly these creases. You need more creases, or no creases at all. Of course, it could just be a square. But uh, you need additional creases. If you add a bunch of extra creases, like in every quadrilateral face, you can get something that is pretty close to a hyperbolic paraboloid. Uh, but this just isn't so. And it's kind of uh, especially a surprise because we've been building things with it for 10 years. Uh, but there you go. The circular so one, so uh, yeah. What you're saying is that you do have extra creases in there that you're just not. What's happening in physical reality, I'm not sure. My guess would be is there's lots of little extra creases you can't see. Mm -hmm. uh, and you get some evidence of that that the, the, on the boundary it's kind of wavy. And in the theory, the boundary is actually what we really can't say much about. It's the interior stuff that we can say really is impossible. So something's happening in here. <laughs> yeah, flat, flat paper can bend. That's fine. I mean, paper bends. All, you can curve it and do all sorts of fun things. But the way those creases are arranged prevents it from bending, essentially, is what we prove. It's not obvious. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, we have not built this out of metal. Uh, oh, I see. Um, this thing. Yeah, well, so here, there's no paper in between. And that's what makes it possible. So this, is, this does exist as a skeleton, but you can't fill it in and actually come from a flat piece of paper. Right, you could do it with non-flat paper. Yeah. Uh, essentially, we, we showed that in the interior of the crease pattern, uh, one of these faces must remain planar. So like one of these quadrilaterals must remain planar. It cannot twist. It can't, can't bend out of the plane. In general, that's not true. But with straight creases, it is true. So whereas here, we're pretty sure this does exist. Uh, with, with curved creases, you can do it. These parts are bending quite a lot in, in this model. Nothing is planar. But over here, in fact, to our surprise, those faces must stay so planar. you have a proof that this one does, that the one on the right does exist, or you just don't have a disproof? 
we are close to a proof that it exists. Uh, this exclamation part should have like an asterisk or something. <laughs> There's some missing punctuation. Yeah. When I wrote this slide, I thought we had a proof, but it's, it's a little tricky. Exactly. We have the good idea, but we don't have the careful execution. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the assumptions are th that crease pattern, which is what we've always been folding. We assumed worked, does not work. You have to add extra creases. Or else is going on in model. Right, or it's not mathematical paper. So we assume zero thickness, which should make it easier. Um, most of our assumptions should make things easier. It's just you have a square and you want to preserve the distances. That's it. Uh, yeah, we're assuming the paper does not compress, right? So it's, I mean, intrinsically, all distances are preserved. We have some other work where we consider crinkling effects, like when you wrap a spherical chocolate, uh, then you need a different model. But here, we assume that. I think so. I should get a microscope and take a look. It, it's, I'm not sure what exactly we can see in the physical model, but it's definitely worth investigating. Because the theorem just says, well, you can't, but... Yes. Right. So I th that's my guess of what's happening. But it could be that paper is somehow stretching or compressing or something, but it's got to be doing that really small, so I don't really believe that. Anyway, let's move on. Um, back to art now. That was maths. So we got to alternate. Uh, this is the title slide, and in the background here is a sculpture that's at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, MoMA. And uh, it's based on an extension of that idea with the circular creases. But instead of just 360 degrees of material, we actually go around twice for 720 degrees, join the end. So you get this uh, negative curvature ramp. And uh, you pleat concentric circles alternating mountain and valley. And you get a lot of twisting and curving and uh, nice uh, organic forms. There's uh, actually three pieces. Uh, there and their permanent collections on display in the architecture exhibit, um, and uh, some really nice organic forms. And this is art motivated by the mathematical challenge of what shapes can you get? What we want to exploit self-folding principles to make. You know, I want to say, you know, make my crazy space station. Can I just manufacture a sheet that will pop into that 3D form when it's out in space or whatever? This is the deployable structure idea. Uh, we're not there yet, but we have some nice e examples along the way. Hey, there's a glass lab person here. Um, we have an upcoming show in Houston where we look at our original idea from 10 years ago of taking multiple uh, squares and joining them. Now we're doing it with circles because squares don't exist anymore. <laughs> we <laughs> like to move on. Uh, and here you get even cooler forms, I think, with the combining multiple circular uh, curved creases. Sorry? It looks as if it has crinkles in addition. <laughs> here the crinkles should not be mathematical crinkles. <laughs> there always is our imprecision. And the reason we th thought that this thing existed is we just thought we weren't folding it perfectly enough. I mean, it's, yeah, there's crinkles, but every origami has crinkles. So. Anyway, that's a diversion. Uh, back on the, yeah. It depends how complicated it is. Uh, these, these I think were made by hand in Belgium, uh, which makes it harder. We didn't have a laser cutter. I was in sabbatical in Belgium. Uh, so this probably would take about six hours, uh, maybe four hours if you had a laser cutter. Uh, some of them take longer. And if you have just a few creases, it's a lot shorter. Give you some idea. Um, here we're, we're uh, changing the crease patterns, looking at ellipses, offset ellipses, in order to get architectural forms. This is work with a PhD student in, at MIT architecture department, uh, Dukes Koschitz. And uh, we're getting a, a lot more control over what kind of forms uh, you can get as a result of this. And, and we're looking at how you can take this to building furniture, to building buildings. And so this is the 10-year story. We started with art. We went to math. We went to art. We went to math. We went to art. We went to math. And we went to art. And so this has been really powerful for us to think about both. 
This one, architecture. OK, that one's a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> Okay, but we're, I mean, we're studying the creases in a more mathematical way, trying to go through methodically and characterize what forms you can get. We're not done yet, but that is the, it's more directly that instead of just form. Yeah? <laughs> left, right, left, right, B, A, B, A, select, start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess the short answer is no. Um, this alternation, the pl that's the pleading idea, and that seems powerful. I mean, of course, general origami doesn't do that. We're actually going to talk about general origami next. But I don't know of a, a middle ground between those two. There may be something interesting there, but I don't know it. Yeah? How big is that? This one? About this big. So far, we haven't gone much bigger than that. We're working on it. Uh, we just got an a access to a four foot by four foot laser cutter in the media lab, which should let us go about twice that size uh, with paper or other things. Although getting paper that big, well, anyway, <laughs> practical issues. <laughs> in Belgium, we used a compass. But if you want to do non-circular creases, it gets harder. <laughs> so uh, this pleated story fits into a larger context of origami. So let me talk a bit about that. Origami is, is probably thousands of years old. It started with things like folding a crane in this way. But these days, in the last 20 years or so, it's become this amazing art form where you can take a square of paper, no cuts, and fold a three-headed dog or a dragon with hundreds of scales. Uh, and this is all made possible through mathematics. Uh, I'll give you some more fun pictures. This is the challenge to make a sailboat. And you could take a square piece of paper that's white on one side, brown on the other, and make uh, two people of two different races and sails different from the color of the boat. You could fold it boss relief. You could fold it with the sails closed. You could fold it with the sails open. Or you could fold a sailboat being attacked by a giant squid, <laughs> all from one square of paper, no cuts. And the top three were folded by MIT students, uh, which is kind of cool. There's an origami club at MIT uh, that has uh, these two guys are amazing designers that all come up in the last five years or so. Uh, usually the square is about twice the size as the model. So this guy is, I think, about this big, and it started from a square, something like that. Yeah, it's, it's a funny sort of law in origami. It seems to hold that you only shrink by around a factor of two in what people actually fold. That's not true in general, but practically. It's common. Uh, this gives you an idea of the latest and greatest. This is from an origami convention two months ago. Uh, you have these crazy tessellation folds <laughs> that seem to do all sorts of 3D surfaces, still not known exactly what's possible. One square of paper. Uh, all of these are one square of paper, no cuts. Crazy, huh? So we would like to do more. I mean, this is just the beginning. Uh, I think the origami art form is still moving very fast. Every year we see new and exciting things. And a lot of this is made possible through our mathematical and algorithmic understanding of how paper folds. Things like hyperbolic parabolas not existing is actually getting at what's actually possible. Now one of the early results, this is also 10 years ago, uh, says that at least everything is possible in principle. So if you have a polygon you want to fold, you can make that from a large enough square with no cuts. If you have a two color pattern like, oops, sorry, following origami here, like this uh, four by four checkerboard, uh, you can fold it from a square piece of paper. I can do this without dropping anything. That's white on one side and red on the other. Uh, Yael, could you refold this for me? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> You have uh, an hour. It's the time. Uh, any polygonal two-color pattern can be made with a square, a bicolor square like that. Or you can give me a 3D model, and in principle, that can be folded from a large enough square. All right, done already. Very good. Perfect. No, no that's good. You should take credit when you can. Yeah. All right. Ah. Uh, no, anything, any polyhedral surface can be folded exactly. In, uh, 
you know, it works from anything. Square is just to make it a little more challenging. Yeah, any shape can be folded down to square, and then from there you fold into something else. Yeah, so, exact. Yes. You, you can mix this result and this result. In theory. Now, <laughs> there is an algorithm here. It runs in polynomial time. It gives you a polynomial size output. But in practice, it is completely impractical. So what polynomial? Uh, I think it's reasonable. But it's probably got a square in there, at least. And um, in origami, you want like 2. You don't want a factor of n scale. Uh, so we've been working on improving this. So this is just the beginning. Uh, one early result in practical origami theory is the, uh, the tree method of origami design, which has been co-developed by a lot of Japanese artists and Robert Lang in the, in the North America side. And the last few years, we've been formalizing this into an actual provably correct algorithm. We're almost done, but it's, it's been a, a long, long time running. Uh, the idea is you give it, the input is a stick figure. So I'm not going to try to make an arbitrary polyhedron. I just want a stick figure, let's say you want to make a lizard. It's got a head, some legs, a body, some hind legs, a tail. Uh, you get to specify the lengths of those edges, so you have a metric tree. And your goal is to fold some origami whose projection is that tree. And in this case, if you give it as input, this is not only an algorithm, it's a computer program called TreeMaker. It's freely available. It will give you this crease pattern, which folds into this origami or we call it origami base because it's not a lizard yet, but at least has the right limbs in the right places of the right lengths. And then you have to shape that into a lizard. A practical example of that is this uh, scorpion. You, the input is this. The output is this, which you fold, you get this. And uh, then a little bit of shaping, you get that. <laughs> so indeed, the, it's hard to see, but the projection of this base is that. So it's, it's a little, everything's on top of each other. Uh, not really. I mean, so this is wiggly, that but stick. it's essentially that stick figure. You just make it look nice. Yeah. So there's obviously a lot going ar on in the artistic side here still. The theory gives you this part, uh, and we would like to understand more of this part. Yeah. Uh, we claim to know all the creases that make this possible, and it actually does fold. Yeah. I mean, the fact that we can now draw this picture, I mean, I mean, this is computed also by the algorithm. And uh, I mean, it's offset a little bit so you can see it by hand. But uh, there is an exact process here, which we. Oh, this. Yeah, yeah, OK. It's hard to say what this is exactly. But yeah, you could argue about it existing. Well, the next result, uh, the latest thing we're working on, is really folding any 3D surface efficiently unlike the, the 10 years ago result. This started with a computer program by Tomohiro Tachi in Japan a few years ago. And we've been working over the last year, in particular, on making it a provably correct algorithm. Uh, so these are two examples of actual foldings, photographs, of the Utah teapot and the Stanford bunny. Uh, this is the crease pattern for the Stanford bunny. Uh, it's something I think a human could not come up with by hand. Uh, but it really shows the power of algorithmic origami design. Uh, and hopefully this will open the door to a whole new range of origami design that we haven't seen yet. A lot of what you saw was based on this theory. But now we can do so much more. Uh, oh, so this doesn't come from the tree. There's no tree. Right, there's no tree here. It's just I give you a polyhedral surface. I say I want these triangles with these edge lengths glued like this. Make it. And it finds essentially the optimal folding of that polyhedron. Now, there's an issue of which polyhedra will yeah. look nice, which are. So it finds the optimal in, in what time? <laughs> I'm not at liberty to say. <laughs> I, 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 you have to maybe define the model in the right way, and subject to that, it will be optimum. But I'm not sure exactly what that model is yet. We're working on it. This is still fresh. So there does fresh. Have a utility function for which that's the optimum. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> like most things. Yeah, okay. But definitely, it's actually practical, whereas the previous stuff was not. And exactly the optimality claim, because I haven't proved it yet, we don't know. But this is really exciting, I think, because this, this has sort of been the holy grail for algorithmic origami design. And it looks like we're getting there. Tachi? 
I mean, it's an extension of existing gadgets that work together in a nice way. And so he's an architect, and he'll come up later in the talk. Um, and so he wanted to design interesting folded forms. In architecture, it's a lot easier if you can start with sheet material, because it's more easier to buy. Uh, and then you fold it into some 3D form. Now, he doesn't want to make actual bunnies. Well, maybe. It's a cool sculpture. But he really, he wants to build, uh, I, uh, we're not there yet, but he wants to build uh, buildings, uh, pavilions, furniture. And so he was just motivated by that practical problem. And yeah, he bumped into this stuff. But I mean, it does have connections to, uh, it has precedent. But. Uh, no, that was just like a, like a practical observation. In theory, it can be really bad. Uh, it's not. I thought the unsquared yeah. was the time, not the amount of, the amount of paper, though. Both. Factor, Both. I think the algorithm runs in linear in this complexity of the model. Um, one of the big questions is how hard it is to fold an n by n checkerboard. And we're pretty sure you need uh, a, fact, a scale factor of n in each dimension, or theta n. Now, exactly what the constant is in that theta is under question, because we just, in an upcoming paper at Isaac, uh, we reduced what we thought was the optimal by a factor of 2. So now we have no idea what the lower bound is. Uh, we never did, but we had a guess. And now we don't even know what the, the right answer should be. But I think there are examples that are really hard to fold uh, in theory. But practically, a lot of the polyhedra people care about seem to be good. But I don't have a, a practical number measured there. Yeah. It's not known, at least for this model. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I should think about that. Maybe there's some. Uh, some extreme example where you can get a lower bound. The, the, the main example that people have thought about is this one because it's sort of practical. People like folding checkerboards, but well, we can talk about that. It would be cool. I, I, there should be some information theoretic something, but I haven't seen it yet. It's MP complete to fold the best uh, scaling. I mean, if I give you a piece of paper and a thing you want to make to find the smallest piece of paper that makes that thing, that's MP complete. Or deciding whether A folds into B is MP complete. Yeah, there you go. Well, large enough A folds into B. Let's move on to s robotic paper. So this is a piece of paper, papers in quotes, that folds itself. You say, uh, I mean, it's designed, this one is designed to fold into a table. There's shape memory alloy that pulls like muscles along each crease and folds it into your desired origami. There's a wire which is sending electrical current to the shape memory alloy. And you could, in principle, put a battery there. Uh, but we just haven't detethered it. This is just over the last year we've been developing this. This video is from a few months ago, I think. It's finally working. Underlying it is a theory for one universal crease pattern that can fold uh, anything, uh, anything uh, that's orthogonal, where all the faces are, are axis aligned. Um, so like, if you want to make this, uh, 3D Tetris piece, this is the crease pattern, or a crease pattern that will fold into it. This is work with Aviv in particular, who's here. Yeah. Um, so whereas with Origamizer, we could make one crease pattern for one model, here we'd like a reconfigurable robot that can go from one shape to another. And so we want one crease pattern that does it. This box pleating pattern is well known in origami. People thought it was good and quite powerful and sort of an easy starting point, but we finally proved that it is universal. And this is a movie from just uh, last week, I think, of this is actually one sheet that it has six wires now. You send it one signal, and it folds into an origami boat. All these creases are folding simultaneously with shape memory alloy. There's some magnets, which will make it snap at the end when it reaches some critical distance. One more snap. And there you go, your, your boat. <laughs> um, and then if you send it a different signal, uh, it first folds these two creases. Okay, so you can do this multi-stage origami. And then you send it a third signal, and it folds those three creases simultaneously. This is technically challenging because we're folding around another crease. And so the, the crease material here is actually flexible, stretchy like rubber. And uh, that lets us get past. And there are a lot of practical issues when you're not working with real paper. 
Uh, and you have some thickness in your material. You've got to have electronics through there, all the power distribution. But this is. Uh, <laughs> no, I just don't remember all the technical words, sorry. Um, there are lots of materials that work. Uh, like there's, there's, a, there's a lot of work in flexible electronics, like in the, the folding part of your uh, laptop that connects the, the screen to the, to the display card. And that's what we're using for the electronics part. But exact, uh, we've used lots of different materials for the for the hard, the hard part, the flexible part, and the shape memory alloys. Kapton, thank you. Yeah, that's the, the usual flexible electronics one. And uh, I think the first video, most of it was actually Kapton, uh, but this last one we're using some other materials, which I don't remember. And the flexible stuff, I also. It's yeah, it's it's a name brand, right? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think it's mostly plastic and the hard part and. Uh, some some anyway, glass yeah. fiber sounds familiar. Yeah, there are lots of possibilities. Um, now that we have four by four sheets, we want to go bigger. This is last week, so hopefully next year we'll have really cool origami transformers. Basically, <laughs> yeah. Uh, these ones, a yeah, little trick: we're not unfolding them itself. It could. You need a you need basically twice as many actuators, one to do the unfolding. Uh, so here we're unfolding by hand, which is still, I mean, most humans can unfold. It's, it takes an origamist to fold. <laughs> so <laughs> you can imagine practical scenarios where folding is enough automatically. But yeah, right now we're unfolding manually. But we can do so in theory. So um, here we're only using batteries to control the shape memory alloy. The goal, the idea is that once it's in the form, the magnets hold it together. Now, and we've also played with um, nanofiber connectors, which are really strong, uh, but they fail after a bunch of uses. So, I mean, this, uh, but the goal is to make it unpowered in its folded state and in its unfolded state. And we just need power to do the transformation. All right, uh, here's a, a different take on this sort of uh, uh, taking self-folding to a, a practical extension. Uh, this is some material, which I won't go into. Um, and, and in the creases here, we put uh, a material. That, this is the stuff that in the, uh, in the sweatshirts that have like big names written on them, and they're all puffy. So that stuff comes in a powder, which when you heat, it, becomes, it grows in size by like a factor of 1,000, and it becomes squishy and puffy. So when you put this thing in the oven and you heat it up, it folds into that form automatically. This is self-folding origami realized. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's probably not edible. <laughs> but uh, I think this is really exciting for not so much reconfiguration, but just manufacturing. It's relatively easy to manufacture flat things. Then you could use this to f automatically fold into 3D things. Uh, here's finally the promised metal folding. Uh, these are made with a water jet cutter. It perforates. This is originally a sheet of steel, and it's perforated with a water jet cutter uh, and folded by hand over many hours. Here's a, a few snapshots from the, the movie of the making of, um, of a different model. This is with some uh, ellipses. And that's Dukes, and that's Tomohiro Tachi. So two architects, one from MIT, one from Tokyo. And uh, you can see the force involved with this guy's <laughs> expression. Uh, but in the end, you get some really uh, exciting structures, which we knew existed in paper, or we, we knew we could build in paper. But now uh, we'd like to go bigger. And with metal, you can support a lot more weight. You can imagine making playgrounds, making uh, buildings. No, it's, it's sharp at the cuts. So you do need gloves for that. OK. <laughs> um, it is hard to fold. And so we're thinking about ways to automate that. Currently, we're doing it all by hand. It takes a lot of muscle power. So either we hire some muscle, <laughs> or, um, or we find more. We have to build machines to do this for us, because there isn't anything that really deals with curve creases uh, in a great way. Uh, final folding topic is connecting to the beginning of the talk, which is, was glass blowing. 
here, uh, this is not glass blowing, but it's working with glass to do folding. Now glass, when you're working with it, is hot. It's about 1,000 degrees or more, uh, maybe 1,500. And you uh, can't touch it. So you can't fold it in the traditional way, like that metal we've been, we were forcing really hard. Um, here, we're using gravity in a particular way to self-fold. Uh, so the idea is you take uh, strips of glass. The white glass is relatively stiff, and the black glass is relatively flexible. It heats up faster, and you heat it up in here to fuse it all together, uh, put all those pieces together. Uh, you throw it in an annealing oven vertically, and uh, you have some uh, metal casing to uh, keep it controlled in size, and it will naturally fold back and forth. And depending how you heat it, you'll get different shapes. And this is one example of what we could do. So this has been fun to try to combine. Our, we've always wanted to combine everything. So combining glass and folding was a challenge. This is so far one-dimensional folding, and it's the beginning of maybe a lot. OK, uh, next diversion is puzzles. I know there are a bunch of puzzle people in the audience. Uh, and uh, mathematicians tend to like puzzles because math sort of is about solving puzzles. They just may be theoretical puzzles. Uh, puzzle design combines math and art because you want it to look good and to be interesting mathematically. Most puzzles are. And a lot of our inspiration comes from this guy, Martin Gardner, who uh, my dad likes to say he was named after, being another Martin. Um, and we have, uh, we've edited a couple of books in his honor. Uh, but he's inspired both the puzzles and the magic, which we'll get to later. Uh, so these are some examples of puzzles. We design a puzzle for CSAIL each year. And uh, for a lab annual meeting, these are four of them, not, not all of them. I know Charles solves them every year. And uh, what's interesting about these puzzles is that they are each based on a mathematical open problem that we've been trying to solve. And so to somehow express that difficulty, we made a puzzle that's also somehow challenging in the same way. So this puzzle is, I'm not going to go through them, what the actual puzzles are here. If you want to try them, go to our web pages. You can print them out and try it and fold them, see if you win. Um, this one is based on a mat folding problem that's still open. Uh, this one is based on the checkerboard folding problem, which I talked about. So we finally made progress on it this year, but still there's no lower bound. Uh, this one is based on polyhedron folding, which is essentially organizer. So we've kind of solved this, which is cool. Uh, but that's also recent. And this one is based on a turning inside out problem, which is still unsolved. Uh, telling you what problem they're based on is actually a big hint for solving the puzzle. But uh, I think it's kind of a fun story. Here we're, we're making puzzles inspired by math. Now you can also do it the other way around and do math inspired by puzzles and or games more generally. So here's sort of a, a broad picture of here, computational complexity of games and puzzles. There are all sorts of different games and puzzles. We think of puzzles usually in the one-player column. Uh, there's also zero-player simulations, if you will, like the game of life. There's two-player games like uh, checkers and chess and go, or, or reversey. Uh, and you can also make things even more complicated and add teams to the game, like bridge, with in perfect information between the players. Now, not everything is known here, but this is work in progress for much longer than I've been alive. So since the 70s, people have been thinking about improving the complexities of chess and Go and so on. All right, uh, there was a question mark here. We don't, we don't have a, a known game with this property, but Rengo Kriegspiel, has anyone played? This is the kind of audience where someone may have played. At <laughs> the, um, it's Blind Team Go. So you have four players, and I think at each step, you like write down your move on a piece of paper. You hand it to some trusted uh, computer, basically, who makes that move if possible. And I believe tells you whether the move succeeded, something like that. But you don't actually know what, the other moves, what other moves the other player has made. And if either of the two red players wins, red wins. So among games of that family, <laughs> I should mention the rows here. So there's the bounded version, uh, where you have a polynomial bound on the number of moves you can make, and the unbounded version, where it could go on for a very long time, up to exponentially long. And so you have these natural complexity classes. All of these games are in these classes, where undecidable means all languages. Um, and 
all the games that do not have a question mark, so other than this last column, they are also complete in that class. They are the hardest problems in that class. So for example, playing Go on an n by n board requires exponential time and is the hardest problem among all problems that can be solved in exponential time. So that's a real lower bound, which is pretty cool. Um, here we have games in these categories, but these are, uh, these are the practical ones we would like to understand the complexity of. Now, what, th so a lot of people have been working on this blind team go. Yeah, very practical game. People do play it. <laughs> um, with Bob Hearn, and there's a copy of this book uh, floating around. Uh, Pete has a copy. Uh, and on sale now. <laughs> it's, it's a new book. Um, and what we've been trying to do is, with Bob Hearn is find an underlying theory for that whole picture. So what we have is one model of computation called constraint logic that can be interpreted in all of these categories. There is a zero player and a one player and a two player and so on constraint logic. And, and that one problem is complete in each of those cases. You know, it's x time complete here, it's np complete here, and so on. p complete over here even. Um, and the game is, or the model of computation is very simple. Uh, you have a directed graph. You have blue edges, which are weight 2. You have red edges, which are weight 1. You have directions on the edges. And uh, there must be always <coughs> weight at least 2 incoming at every vertex. So some constraint, some local constraint. And the one move you can do is reverse an edge. So I mean, I can s you don't have to understand that. But in one sentence, I can say what it is. And it works all the way here. And it's very much like puzzles and games we often try to play. And so you can use it for complexity proofs, for hardness proofs. Uh, one problem that was open for a long time since Gardner posed it, I don't know, 20 years before, uh, and we solved it at the beginning, this is our motivation, is the so-called sliding block puzzles. You have uh, here 1 by 2 and 1 by 3 rectangles. You want to know, can I slide the pieces around to move, let's say, one piece out a hole? And uh, this is the proof that that's hard. Once you have our book of theory, so it takes some work to get the underlying theory, but then to solve a particular game or puzzle, you just have to construct a constraint logic AND gate and a constraint logic OR gate, meaning uh, in this case this block can move in if and only if uh, this block can move out and this block can move out by one unit. And similarly this guy can move in if this guy OR this guy can move out. Now they don't have to move in, but they can. And as a result, this problem is p-space complete. Um, a little harder if you want to just do one by two blocks. These are the gadgets you need. But basically, you get proof by picture that a lot of those games and puzzles are as hard as they should be, instead of a proof specific to that game. Yeah, yeah you can't have a knot. Uh, you cannot have a knot in uh, sliding block puzzles, because it's you can never prevent in an explicit way something from going somewhere. It's just it can go here or it can go there. Yeah. So that's what makes this interesting, indeed. That's what constraint logic is all about, that, uh, is the can as opposed to must. And there you don't need negation. You also don't need crossovers. Everything, a lot of things come for free in this world. Um, just to, I mean, not everything is solved here. We simplify a lot of existing proofs, but some proofs do not fit in nicely, and there are some problems remain open. I think one of the coolest is one by one rush hour. You've probably played rush hour with cars that can only move vertically or only move horizontally. It's just like sliding blocks, but they have a direction. Well, suppose you have sort of little unit squares that also have a direction. Uh, this puzzle requires 199 moves to solve, which I think means get this car out this way. And this is the first move. Uh, that's the hardest 5x5 five five puzzle. This is the hardest 6x6 six six puzzle. Is this problem p-space complete in general or polynomial solvable? seems very oh, difficult. Cars, cars cannot turn. They can only go straight. Back, they can go back and forth. They have reverse and forward gear. What does it, does it, it means <coughs> these two go up, and then these three go right, and this one goes down, and these two go left. That's the first move. So they try to, just to simplify the drawings of the moves, they co coalesce them. Okay, one more puzzle for fun. Uh, this is the rolling, what do we call it, the dice rolling puzzle, uh, as posed uh, a few years ago, and then solved a couple years later. Uh, you have a grid of squares. You have a regular six-sided die. You have some numbers in the squares. Um, some of them are blank. You would like to visit every numbered square exactly once, such that um, whenever you visit a number, that number is facing up on the die. 
and the blanks you can do whatever you want. Uh, so can you, given a puzzle, can you solve it? It's MP complete. But a really interesting open question is when you have z no blank squares, every square must be visited exactly once. We think it's polynomial, but it's very tricky to get at. Now, that's fun mathematics, but let's do some performance art inspired by this problem. So we begin dice rolling the movie. Welcome to Dice Rolling the Movie! Right here is our Las Vegas right-handed cube. Each side is numbered from 1 to 6. Notice the bottom is a 6, top is a 1. Well, I noticed that, that the 1 is actually a hole. Why is that? Good question. We like to get immersed in our research. Total immersion. I'm going to climb inside and learn dice rolling from the inside out. Okay then, uh, let's get started. Okay, let me climb inside. Okay. Here we go. Put your head there. Uh, let me get your helmet and your neck guard. All right. Remember kids, don't try this at home. I am a professional stuntman. Been training in this area of dice rolling for years. So we protect your neck against cutting there. And we have a bicycle helmet, which will provide some tent insurance. I hope we don't need this. <laughs> OK, now the plan for today is we're going to take a little tour around this maze, make a cycle. And we're starting in this position. We're going to end in this position, but with a different orientation. We're starting in the one, two, three orientation, remember that, when we get back to this position, we'll be in another place. That is the purpose of this demonstration. Are you ready to roll, Dad? Ready! Let's do it. Roll number one. You okay? All right. Still on here. Ready for roll number two? Ready! Oh, no! Are you okay? Oh. You okay? I, I think that wasn't a good idea. Maybe we didn't plan this out so thoroughly. Okay. Uh, uh, change of plan. We'll, we'll just make a small cycle here. Let's not use the full board, okay? Okay. All right. Roll number two. Take two. Yeah? I'm scared. Okay, roll number three. Oh. All right. Okay, hey, I'm up. Hey, we're high again. Back to regular orientation. How's the helmet holding up? Okay, I'm glad I wore it. <laughs> okay, just one more roll and, and we'll, we're done. Uh, wow, how you doing? Okay. All right, you'll see that we are back in our original position. Now, with the numbers one, four, and five, with five on top instead of one. Ta-da! Oh, hi. No padding in the box. Uh, remember, I'm a trained professional. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Now, for some reason, Marty didn't want to do a second take. <laughs> it's no, I mean, no trick of the camera there is all real. Uh, crazy idea. <laughs> but, uh, this is actually a crucial idea used in a lot of dice rolling mazes and, and even the theorem of being able to change the orientation but getting back to your original position. So it was fun. <laughs> and the general point here is math needs more humor. So keep doing it. Uh, next, we come to the second main story. We started with uh, pleated, pleat folding, and here we have hinge dissection. This is, again, a 10-year story. We've been working on hinge dissections for 10 years. Uh, hinge dissection is 
and we're going to alternate from art uh, between art and math. Hinge dissection is you take a bunch of blocks, here polygons in, in two dimensions, you connect them together at corners, and you want to fold from one shape to another, like a square to an equilateral triangle. This goes back over 100 years, uh, and it's been open since then. Is this always possible? If I give you any two polygons in the same area, do they have a hinge dissection? We, the first thing we did in this area is mathematical. We proved that a particular class of shapes, which is actually a lot, like things you can make on your computer screen with pixels, uh, there's one hinge dissection. If you, if you give me some area you want, some size n, there's one hinge dissection, which looks like this. It folds into all, uh, these are called polyominoes, of a given area, of a given size. So you take n squares, there's one, uh, there's, there's two, well, no, there could be more than one. But there is a 2n piece hinge dissection that can fold into all n ominous. Uh, and you can do that for any shape you want to repeat many times. In particular, we look a lot at these guys. Uh, so this is not everything, but it's every shape up to some coarse resolution, right, if you just sort of round the edges. So that was our first result 10 years ago. Uh, the next thing we did was uh, take that to the design side, and we've always been fascinated by font design. So we made one alphabet where every letter has the same area, and it is made from, uh, I within this class of little right triangles glued together, all the same number of them. It can also make numbers, and it can also make a square. Uh, the hinge dissection has 128 pieces, but it can fold into each of these letters and numbers and a square continuously without self-intersection and all sorts of good stuff. So that was sort of a fun design illustration of mathematics that we knew was possible. Uh, the next thing we did on the math side is uh, extend to 3D. So if you have a bunch of little cubes you want to make, like you want to convert this thing into this thing, or any other thing with eight cubes, uh, there's one hinge dissection which can fold into it. And it looks like this repeated eight times. So these are smaller cubes than those cubes, half the size. And uh, there's a particular hinging pattern, which if you repeat that periodically, will make any shape out of 2 by 2 by 2 cubes. So you lose some resolution, but you can, you can get it. So that's math. Then we took this to sculpture. This is uh, with uh, Lori Palmer, who's a professor of sculpture at University of Chicago. And uh, she had about 1,000 blocks, wooden blocks, and piano hinges and said, I want to build an interactive sculpture that people can change into many different forms. And we happened to be working on the 3D paper at the time. We said, well, we have the hinging for you. Um, we were thinking about cubes, but it turns out that result generalizes to parallel pipe beds, which in particular blocks. And so there's a particular hinging pattern, which she implemented uh, throughout this whole strand. It's periodic. And now this thing can fold into theoretically everything up to that resolution of, of 1,000 blocks. And so you pick up your gloves, you start folding, and this is on display in, in Harvard. Uh, so back to math. Finally, we proved last summer that every dissections, hinge dissections exist. This was a big breakthrough after 10 years of, of trying to solve it. Um, you take any, in fact, you can take many polygons all of the same area. There's one hinge dissection that folds into all of them continuously without self-intersection. It's efficient in theory, um, not so much in practice, but it's a pretty powerful result. Just to give you a, a flavor of, of how we show that, um, hinging, the hard part is hinging. It's actually really easy to cut things up and move them around. But hinging sort of forces things to stay together. What you'd like to be able to do is pretend there are no hinges. Say, well, I can make a shape this way, or I can make a shape this way, where the, this orange piece is moved up to this corner. Um, if I could do that, then I can basically pretend hinges don't exist. And it turns out there is a hinging that can fold into both of those shapes. This is the key idea. So I'm going to refine those. And this one hinge dissection can fold into this or into this. And by a careful repetition of this gadget, and it's more complicated than this in general, but this is the idea, you can ignore the hinging and move everything around. In the obvious, in the obvious way, you get an exponential number of pieces, which may be what you're thinking about, but you can make it pseudopolynomial. The same has to be really two-dimensional that you can slide things over each other. Right? No. This works in the plane without self-intersection. As I've drawn it, maybe not. But you do one more step and you can make it fold in the plane without collision. That's using my thesis. 
Uh, so a lot of cool folding results came together in this, and we used a lot of ideas both from the from the hinged polyomino world and from folding linkages and whatnot to get this result. The the number of pieces depends on on uh, the ratio between the longest edge and the shortest edge uh, polynomially in that. So it's not it's pseudo polynomial, but it does not require rationality or anything. So you can have irrational multiples. That's what made this hard. If it's rational, you can basically use the square result. Yeah. Uh, in this picture, maybe, but uh, there's another step which I'm not showing where you refine it more, and it's uh, it's always possible to fold. Yeah, assuming zero size hinges. Yeah, that's okay. Right? Okay, now this also generalizes to 3D, and we're working, and some of the people are here, it's from the Center of Bits and Atoms, making this a real robot that can, this is a different way to do programmable matter, one robot that can fold into many different shapes. This is a very early prototype, just from a few months ago. Uh, this is an, a non-actuated 3D printed version, but with these geometries, you can uh, make a transformer. Right. Uh, instead of instead of folding a sheet, now we're folding essentially a one-dimensional structure, and the, this is a pretty big one. It's like this big. Uh, the goal is to make it bigger and to make it smaller, depending on what scale thing you want to fold, and also have a lot more pieces. This is just four, I think. Uh, but that's now we're finally applying this theory. Uh, this falls in the context of you don't need to hear all those robots. Uh, uh, modular robots, this is an active area of research, reconfigurable robotics. The difference with hinge dissections, hinge dissections are one connected unit. Here you have lots of little pieces, you don't see them attaching and detaching here. This one's kind of boring, this one's probably the coolest to watch. Uh, these guys are moving around, they have magnets, they're attaching, detaching. Uh, so we avoid the attaching, detaching, which makes things like power distribution a lot easier. Like the folded sheet, you can just power the whole thing with one connected circuit. Um, but these guys are really cool, too, and we, we've studied them. If, and, and just this year, we proved that these three models of reconfiguration instead of computation are equivalent up to constant factors. So even algorithms for reconfiguring these apply here. Uh, these two models were not even known to be universally foldable. This one was. Uh, this is by Daniel LaRusse's group at MIT. And so now we know these are also universally reconfigurable. And very quickly. Uh, there's an algorithm that in a linear number of operations will reconfigure from any shape to any other, and in log n time. So this is basically instantaneous transformation from any shape to any shape. Uh, it, it has a slight catch, which is that every little unit has to, be power, has to have a strong enough motor that it can move all the other pieces. And that's necessary. Uh, if you have constant strength robots, they're, they're matching lower bounds to say you need a factor of n more. But you can still parallelize basically optimally. The log is open whether it should be constant or log, but everything else is uh, worst case optimal. So this is kind of cool. And I think I'll, I'll proceed. The final topic is magic. Uh, and some of you have seen ma these ma uh, some of these magic tricks at the Microsoft Research New England opening event, but I'll do them for the new people. And I've got some new tricks for you. So. Uh, Martin Gardner, surprise, performance art. Okay, uh, magic is fun. We all know that. Uh, the first magic trick we studied mathematically it, um, is mentioned by Martin Gardner. It goes back in particular to Houdini. Before he was a, an escape artist, he was a general magician. And he would take a square piece of paper, fold, uh, make one straight cut, and get a regular five-pointed star. So we thought that was pretty cool. And Martin Gardner did too. And he said, what else can you do? And so this is our first geometry paper, actually, again, with Anna and Marty. So it turns out you can take a rectangle, uh, fold it flat, as shown, make one straight cut, and, and guesses what it might be. Aviv can't answer, because he probably knows the answer. Um, we'll make one straight cut here. And unfold. And we get a swan. I guess you guys aren't impressed. 
I have a backup for you. Uh, there we go. Fold one straight cut. I never know ahead of time whether these will work, so it's a bit a bit scary. Uh, 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 yeah, okay. Here we get a butterfly. <laughs> cool. I'm uh, still not impressed. All right. I uh, only have one more. These are all on my website if you want to impress your friends. Let's go to fold and cut. Last example. Angelfish, <laughs> and you get the idea. So, general thanks. General theorem is you can make any planar graph you want by folding in one straight cut. Uh, these are examples of individual polygons, but you can make several polygons all at once. You cut, and you get the word Microsoft all at once. Uh, that's a little challenging practically, but it can be done. Uh, so that's uh, cool. Theorem. Uh, it's a generalized magic trick. Uh, I think we're just going to go on to coin flipping. Now, I don't know if you guys brought coins with you, but I brought a whole bunch of coins. So here you go. Uh, and this is a trick with a blindfolded magician, but I'm just going to do the trick for all of you simultaneously. And I would be really impressed if I could see all your coins that you're imagining in your head at the same time. So I want you to take three coins and uh, f arrange them left to right and flip them heads or tails however you like. Now I've put all eight arrangements up here for you, so you just focus on the one that you want to pick. Okay, pick any one you like. Are you ready? Okay, now my goal is to make your coins all the same. And I'm going to tell you how to make them all the same. And I want you to focus on the coins in your head and transmit that message to me so that I can see what, what you're thinking. Now, I'm getting a bit of a mixed signal here. Uh, <laughs> Okay, now, now, how many people uh, picked all heads or all tails? Okay, you're done. I, I got you all the same right from the beginning. Ha, huh, that was easy. You can pick a different set if you want. You're trying to fake me out. Okay, now the rest of you, I'd like you to flip the left coin in your arrangement. So watch your configuration, flip the left coin. Okay, now are they all the same? Yeah, I got a few of you. Okay, you were easy. All right, now the rest of you, uh, I'm seeing the middle coin is kind of messed up a little. So let, let's flip the middle coin. OK, are they all the same? Uh, sorry, flip the coin. Are they all the same? Yeah, all right. Got half of you now. All right. Uh, now, the, I'm sorry, for the, for the remainder, I made a mistake in the beginning. I shouldn't have flipped that left coin. Put it back. Now they're all the same. OK, this is a fun trick. You can do it over the radio. It's, it's an old trick. It goes back uh, 1980. Not so well known. Um, there's a general theory, which is maybe not surprising. You're following gray code in a hypercube. It's a little more interesting because you have all heads and all tails as target configuration. So it's a cube folded in half. And so you get a minus one here. And you also get a minus one here. And so for n equals three, for three coins, this is really fast. It grows exponentially, though. So it's a little tricky. But you can generalize it in a lot of interesting ways. So here's a another trick which we studied mathematically and for this oh I forgot my blindfold which means I'm just gonna have to take off my glasses which is <laughs> <laughs> about the same thing uh, but let me first get it set up I need a volunteer from the audience oh blindfold excellent all right this now we've never met before right James <laughs> all right let's um, we'll test this out in a moment now what I have here is uh, four coins and you can flip the coins by pressing on the screen here. Okay? And you can also rotate the board. That's the hard part for me, because I don't know how you're going to rotate it. Now, I'm going to say things like uh, flip the north and west coin. And before you flip them, you can rotate the board however you like. So you're not really flipping the north and west. It could be rotate it, and it's the north and east coin, and so on. So uh, I have a volunteer, someone who knows northeast. All right, Arlo. Now, we've never met before, correct? <laughs> so you understand the rules. Uh, now, my goal is, again, to make the coins all the same. And, uh, wow, well, yeah, I can't see anything. Good. Um, and so first of all, you can set up the coins however you like, just not all the same, like James did earlier. That's a little too easy. Uh, and I should get away so I can't hear you. Oh, you just like tap the screen. It's probably the easiest way. Yeah, like the laptop screen. Sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> okay, you got it? 
All right, now arrange, arrange the coins. <laughs> Stay over here. Arrange the coins however you like. Ready? OK, I'm going to make them all the same. Uh, for starters, flip the north and south coin. But first, you can rotate however many times you like by clicking those buttons in the corner, left corner. Uh, and then flip north and south coins. OK? Now, are, are they all the same? No. OK. Tricky. Uh, now, I'd like you to flip the east and south coin. First, you can rotate, and then flip the east and south coin. <laughs> Careful. OK, now I'm guessing they're not all the same. OK, good. You did well. Uh, now, I'd like you to flip the east and west coin. <laughs> well, you can rotate first if you like. All right, am I done? <laughs> well done. <laughs> OK, now I was lucky because he had an even number of heads. If it was an odd number of heads, I would have had to do it twice as long. But uh, that's the trick. And there's a generalization. This, this rotation operation is a group. And you can characterize exactly which groups let you transform, uh, let the magician force all heads or all tails. Thank you. Uh, and it turns out groups where the size of the group is a power of two, which there's a whole bunch of them. But in particular, if you had five coins here rotating on a table, it would not work. Eight coins would work. And uh, there's a whole bunch of other fun things, which I have not seen implemented as magic tricks yet. But there you go. The last topic for today is a picture hanging puzzle. And like any good talk, we have a lot of rope. And I need more volunteers to get tied up here. And uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> Got one already. I'm going to need three, at least two. So think about more volunteers. All right, we got one more. Good. Uh, now, let me tell you the problem first. Uh, so focus on the slides. Uh, and so normally, you have a picture you want to hang. This is MSR New England. Uh, you put it on a nail. If you remove the nail, the picture falls. Sad. OK, so maybe you back up and you have two nails. Well, now, if I remove one nail, the picture still hangs, maybe a little crooked. I remove both nails, the picture falls. What I'd really like, though, is a way to hang the picture on two nails such that if I remove either nail, it falls. This would be like the trick picture. Okay, so we're going to do this uh, with Jonah, and well, here's a lot of rope. And what I'd like you to do is uh, hold your arms like this, okay, and put your elbows against your body because then they won't get tired. Okay. Now, uh, at this point, you're just inspecting. Okay. Now we have two nails. I have a rope and a picture below. I'm going to hang the picture on. Whoa. Hang the picture on, got some funny nails there. All right, uh, on two nails. And now uh, you sort of pick a, a hand to remove, uh, an arm. We're going to cut it off. Is that OK? <laughs> uh, which one? This one. OK. So we remove this, this nail, and the picture falls. OK? Now just to check, you know, adversarially, uh, we hang it in the same way, hopefully, and uh, pick a different, or a hand. So <laughs> any hand you want. The, his left or our left? His left. his left, okay. So hopefully that one also works. Okay, so that's pick two pictures, two nails, pure topology, okay? Unimpressed yet. Uh, here's the solution. You can check it. And for the, for the mathematically inclined, this is the algebra you should be thinking of. x1 means go around the left nail clockwise. That's the first thing I do. Uh, x1 inverse means go around it counterclockwise. And you do this sequence, you see if you remove the x1s, the x2s cancel and vice versa. So this is a combinator in the free group on two elements. And, and it's cool, and it works. So now, how about this one? Now, I'm going to need your right arm, for starters, and both of your arms. So we're gonna, this is fun, because you have a difference of heights. Uh, so we're going to do three nails uh, in, this, whoa, in this way. Uh, right, right, left. Yeah, I think that's right. That's what I did, clearly. <laughs> and uh, so now, uh, could you pick an arm, any of the three arms you want? <coughs> the center one. Good choice. Common choice. OK, now if we imagine gravity being applied here, this should just come up. 
and the picture falls. And it turns out what's going on here is any one of the three will make the picture fall. And you can think about why that is. Let's do it one more time because they, they don't look convinced. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. so this is hard because I need a stack in my head and I have to unroll this expansion. Um, do algebra. Uh, so uh, could you pick an arm? Uh, yes, all right. This nice simple one. It's a good test. Okay, now this, if we imagine, you can pull your arms apart maybe. And yeah, false. Okay, cool. All right, that was three arms. Four arms uh, requires a bit more rope. So all, all arms up, please, and put your elbows against your body. Good. All right, so we do uh, this. Okay, and then we go here and there and uh, this and this way and I think here maybe. Okay, now we leave. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, I'll pick an arm. This one. All right. Okay, very good. And now it just comes off there. That's looking good. You want to pull apart a little bit? Don't, don't kill yourself. Oh, I think, whoop, well, that was the end. <laughs> that should stay. Oh. oh, okay, okay, this one comes up. I just imagine infinite gravity. And this one, whoa, I can't see anymore. There we go. That's the end. And then it comes up here, and then over here, and we're done, right? Cool. Hopefully you believe it. Okay, let's do something a little simpler, maybe. Now think about what does this mean? I'm going to do it on uh, three arms. I need three arms. Okay, so what does this do? Two out of three. Good. So uh, pick one. Farthest one for you. This one, so this should not fall. Good. In fact, this is the two nail solution, and now I'll pick another arm. This is one. Okay. And it falls. Okay? Easy, right? And you can, um, you can generalize that. Of course, this is three out of four. I won't bother. It's kind of boring. But let's uh, make it a little more interesting. I'm going to swap one and two on the right and three and four on the right. Like that. Okay, now, what does that do? Okay, arms up, all four. <laughs> x1, x2, x3, x4, x2 inverse. Uh, x1 inverse, x4 inverse, x3 inverse. Any guesses? Either the left two or the right two. Good. So pick an arm. All the way over here. Okay, that should not fall. And you want to pick another? All the way on the right. So it should still not fall. And we should get the two nail solution if I did it right. And then we pick another arm. And there it goes. Okay, cool. All right, still kind of easy. Uh, this is a good one. It's one of my favorite. Now I'm going to renumber these a little bit. Uh, oh, what the hell? We can do it this way. So uh, this is supposed to be either uh, <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't want to read it. This is kind of cheating. So I'm going to either do uh, both of these arms or one of these arms. Okay, so either both of these arms or either of these arms, both of these arms or either of these arms. I think that's right. Uh, pick an arm. This one. So that should make the whole thing fall. Looks good. Okay, but maybe you're not convinced. Let's do it again. Uh, either of these arms or both of these arms. Uh, either of these arms or both of those arms. Is that what I did last time? <laughs> All right, uh, pick an arm. Uh, the, this right one. This, 
This one. His right. Okay. It's this one, so this should not do anything. Looks taut. Okay. Um, another arm, Christian. His other arm. All right. You guys are so predictable. <laughs> That's okay. It works even in the adversarial model. <laughs> So this comes up. That's the great thing about math magic tricks, is they always work. <laughs> if you do it right. All right, thanks, guys. You can go back. General theorem is any monotone Boolean function can be constructed in this way. You give me any collection of subsets that you want, that when you remove them, everything falls. Of course, if you remove more stuff, it will also fall. That's the monotone part. But anything else is possible. And uh, so you get, we get to use lots of fun things from monotone function theory, algebra, and topology, and the connection between the two, and of course, puzzles and magic. And that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs> so, any more questions? Guys, I have lots of questions. Yeah, I used to be bad at visualization. I hadn't really done geometry before. It just, you learn it. <laughs> now I'm pretty good. <laughs> yeah. The picture hanging puzzle, uh, if you view the projection, the, the crossing pattern from the side, there are crossings. If there aren't yes. crossings, do you still do anything? I don't know. Uh, I think you know, it used to be on the wall in the Berkeley Math Department of this way of winding around. I'm not sure. We, sh we should think about that. I have, haven't seen that. There are still some complexity issues, like how many winds you need to do. And I think it's polynomial in general, but that's, there's no clear lower bounds. and Yeah. Yes. Well, it's supposed to be approximately a hyperbolic parabola, but it doesn't even exist, so how can it be approximately anything? Right, it's impossible to build this in mathematical space with these crease patterns, with these creases. Right. Yeah. With the ones you put in, but there are other creases. If you put extra creases, or maybe nature is doing that for us, then yeah. I was sort of joking. I mean, we still do work on these things. Uh, and this is sort of still new to us that it doesn't exist. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're happy to, to still work with it, but we would put in extra creases probably. To, in fact, we built one uh, a couple months ago out of metal, out of sheet metal with uh, the extra creases, just to sort of check. Now, I mean, that doesn't prove anything. We have, but we have a proof using interval arithmetic and whatnot. Yeah. Yes. I guess if you heat the metal very hot, you can use gravity to fold it. Um, we haven't tried that, but yeah, that would, that's true. That's a good, that's a neat approach. Right. And then you have a lot more control. Uh, in the glass folding, it was kind of fun that we didn't have control, and so it was more organic. Uh, but yeah, you Certainly, instead of perforating, you could imagine heating, welding, basically, and then, and then folding by hand. That would probably make it easier. But doing lots of creases at the same time, which is kind of necessary for this, is still a challenge. You could cook the whole thing, but then it might all melt. And you could use two different metals with different melting points. Uh, there's lots of possibilities. So far, we've just done it with glass. Yeah? Uh, essentially, we are, like, here where it's possible. We are simultaneously folding all the creases at once. And w in practice, we approximate that by making lots of little folds all over. Yeah, but that's sort of necessary in actually most of origami. Uh, and we even do it in the, in the uh, robotic origami. We saw lots of creases were folding at the same time, and it's resolving those forces. Yeah. Was, uh, 
Well, before he was an escape artist, he was just into magic. And it took a while, this is in the 20s, so it took him a while to find escape artists, escape artistism as his calling. And, uh, he might do that in the future. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah. He probably already has. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> it's a G-rated show. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, sure. Uh, not so much in the stuff I've talked about, but say in the linkage folding world, pretty much everything moves, and it's all about how to get from one state to the other and, and move through that. You sort of see that in the hinge dissections, too. They have various stopping states, but they can just keep going. So you could imagine building kinetic sculptures out of that, and like Arthur Ganson is an expert in that. Uh, we haven't done a lot of kinetic sculpture ourselves, but we would like to. Another question over there? Uh, the question is, is there a relationship between the fold in one cut and the folding any polygon? Um, there's actually a closer connection between fold in one cut and the tree method of origami design, though that's not at all obvious. They both have a common root problem, which is I have a graph, and I want to take all the edges of that graph and, and bring them into alignment, into one line. And they both have to solve that, and they do it in slightly different ways, so there's a close connection there. Folding polygons uses a different trick, currently. Uh, but the origamizer uses some similar ideas, let's say. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> so the question is, can you have, can you force in the hinge dissections, I guess, can you force one vertex to lie along a line? Um, so I don't know. Final state, yeah, you can. In 3D, you definitely can. Uh, because you can set up blocks so that in, in a plane, it's acting like a linkage, like a robotic arm. And there's a linkage from 1800s or se se by Poissier uh, that forces a point to move along a line if you, if you move other things around arbitrarily. So I, th I think so. So I haven't seen that built in a 3D system. In the plane with, with robotic arms, you can do it. All right, thanks very much.